I've been involved in software metrics on and off for many years. And during that time, my views about what's feasible and useful have changed quite significantly. Today, I'm going to provide a summary of what those changes are, and I'll also provide directions for using metrics in a most practical way for risk assessment. I want to start by getting you thinking about an issue that was raised by one of the all-time greats of software metrics, Bob Grady of Hewlett-Packard, as you can see here. Bob was responsible for what I believe was recognized as the first true company-wide metrics program. His excellent 1987 book about software metrics programs with Deborah Caswell described the techniques and experiences associated with that at Hewlett-Packard. Now, in 1993, I was at a meeting where Bob told an interesting story about that metrics program. He said that one of the main objectives of the program was to achieve process improvement by learning from metrics what process activities worked and what ones didn't. To do this, they looked at those projects that in metrics terms were considered most successful. Now, they felt that the key measure of a successful project was one which is delivered high quality to the end user. The measure they used for this, like many practitioners, was the rate of customer reported defects. So, for example, the number of defects found by customers per thousand lines of code in the first six months of operation. A project was classified as successful if it recorded a significantly below average defect density. So popular data, for example, suggests that if you achieve less than two defects per thousand lines of code, then you're doing pretty well. The idea was to learn what processes characterize those most successful projects. Now it turned out that what they learned from this strategy was very different to what they'd expected. I'm not going to tell you what it was I learned until the end of my presentation, and by then, I hope that you will have worked it out for yourself. I'm going to speak for 45 minutes. I'll start by giving a lightning history of software metrics, explaining why almost all metrics activities can be traced to a couple of very simple technical objectives about resource and quality that are then wrapped up in standard statistical methods. The good news is that globally, Software Metrics has provided some decent benchmarking information about software projects, and locally, it's led to managers having greater control over projects. The bad news is that traditional metrics and models don't provide the kind of quantitative information that I think software managers have a right to expect. And I'm talking about information like, for a problem of this size, given these limited resources, how likely am I to achieve a product of suitable quality? Or how much can I scale down the resources if I'm prepared to put up the products of specified letter quality? Or if I can't sacrifice quality, how good do the staff have to be to build the systems with the limited resources? Now, this is all about quantified risk assessment to help decision making. I don't think software metrics ever properly address, address that true objective. I'm going to try and convince you that the true objective can be met by considering causal factors in the software process. I'm going to show you a simple example of a causal model in action. And this model is a simplified version of the kind of model that's been used extensively now with great effect at a number of different blue chip organizations. I'll show results achieved in practice that are very impressive compared with traditional approaches. I'll also show an example of a model that's been widely used to answer exactly the kind of risk trade-off questions that I just mentioned, the things that project managers really need to know. It's about risk management by modeling trade-offs between resources, time, quality, and functionality. What's important about this type of modeling is that it doesn't necessarily require the kind of extensive data collection programs that are known to have killed off many metrics initiatives. On the contrary, the approach recognizes that data may be very scarce, and instead it incorporates expert judgment where necessary. Now, since the early 1970s, most software metrics activities generally work in the following way. There's something, why, about a project that we really want to assess or predict. So, for example, why might be effort required to complete? Or, as in the Hewlett-Packard case, why might be the quality delivered to end users? The problem is that to measure or predict why, we've got to find one or more things X that we can measure relatively easily. 
So think of an analogy of measuring room temperature. That's hard to measure directly, so instead we actually measure the length of a mercury column, which is a lot easier. So we use X to infer what we really want to measure or predict. So for example, in software projects, code size is a very commonly used X when Y is effort, and defects found is a very commonly used X when Y is quality. So, using past project data, we plot the two measures, X and Y, where each dot represents a project. Then we apply statistical regression methods, which is all about finding the line that best fits. Now, this line is defined by a function S, and we can use it to make predictions of Y in future projects once we've measured X. So the defining method of software metrics is conceptually simple. And that's not the only thing that's conceptually simple about software metrics. <clears throat> it turns out that just about every single technical development in the history of software metrics was driven by two types of Y values, something like resource or something like quality. Hence, most of software metrics has been driven by models that tend to look something like this. <coughs> so productivity here, where size is often measured by lines of code and effort by program and months. Effort here is again some function of size, and the form here is, the, is a classic um, one which was proposed in the initial Kokomo model by Barry Beam, where size was a derivative of lines of code. It's crucial to note that the values for A and B here were calculated by the statistical regression approach that I previously indicated. And finally, quality is again some function of size, so the most common measure of quality is the very one that Bob Grady and Hewlett Packard used to determine which were the successful projects, those which had the lowest rate of defects reported by customers. Now, almost as an aside, it's pretty clear from that brief review that size matters a lot. For the model to be of practical use, size has got to be easily measurable. And the most widely recognized and easily measurable software size measure is lines of code. But what this means is that lines of code is actually used as a surrogate for different notions of size, notably complexity and difficulty. Now, unfortunately, lines of code, while being an excellent measure of program length, is rather a poor measure of complexity or difficulty. Now, this and many other weaknesses of lines of code as a size metric obviously led to work on improved size metrics. The holy grail is a size metric to replace lines of code that's not only language independent, but can capture notions of complexity and difficulty. An example here of an attempt at this would be the function point metric. Now, in principle, this metric is ideal because it measures the functional complexity of the problem to be solved rather than a delivered solution. So it's actually measurable at the start of the project. The drawback is that it's actually quite complex to measure. Also, the limitations of lines of code and other metrics led to a massive interest in finding things like improved complexity metrics. And here, I'm, I guess I'm talking about complexity of the solution rather than the problem. So examples of structural metrics like McCabe's cyclomatic complexity metric are metrics that can be extracted from designs rather than just code. There are, for example, a whole host of object-oriented metrics. So the good news is that published empirical results and models have led to some very useful benchmarking standards. There's been a significant increase in industrial metrics activity, and I actually think that most IT companies have some kind of metrics program, even if they don't regard them as